Thank you. Uh, thank you all for being here. Tomek thank you for inviting me. And uh, it's, always, uh, it's always good to be back in Poland. And thank you for uh, tolerating a talk in, uh, in English. But believe me, it's much better than if I tried it in any other language. Uh, so uh, bear with me. Financial markets, financiers, bankers, users. I can't think of a group of businessmen, and for that matter, a group of people more hated in history than financiers. Dante has the money lender in the seventh rung, seventh rung of hell with a bag of gold around his neck and the bag is so heavy it's dragging him down into the fires. Shakespeare, I don't know if you, you read Shakespeare in Poland? Shakespeare, one of my favorite plays of Shakespeare is The Merchant of Venice, I highly recommend it. And in The Merchant of Venice, the Jewish moneylender, Shylock, is the villain. And what is it that he's accused of? You know, the Christian moneylender accuses him of, of being a bad person. Why is he a bad person? Because he dares to charge interest on a loan. The Christian says, if you're a good Christian, if you're a good person, and somebody needs a loan, you lend him money without charging interest. Shakespeare. Every villain, every villain today, and, and for the last 200 years in literature, in movies, is almost always a successful businessman. And if he's really evil, he's a successful banker. We despise finance. We live in a culture that despises the idea of making money from money. And as a consequence, we always blame bankers and financiers for every problem that we have. Which economic crisis over the last 2,000 2, years has not been blamed on banks? Great Depression was the stock market, right? The collapse in the stock market, speculation in the stock market caused the Great Depression. Now, now no real economist, and I emphasize real, no real economist actually believes that. But it's in the popular culture. Everybody thinks that. You go into high schools or colleges, everybody knows. It's financiers. It's financial speculation. It's stock markets that caused the Great Depression. Who caused the financial crisis? Just the recent one, 2008. Before anybody did any analysis on it, before anybody figured out what was actually going on from an economic perspective, we all knew who caused the financial crisis. It was in the headlines of the New York Times, Washington Post, even the Wall Street Journal. It was Wall Street. Those evil financiers. There was greed on Wall Street. And that caused the financial crisis of 2008. Again, no real slash serious economist believes that. Seriously, uh, or, or significantly in 10 years, no economist will believe that. It takes a little while for the truth to get out there and for people to actually recognize the truth. But in both the Great Depression and in the case of the financial crisis, the causes of it were government, central bankers. And if you want more details on those, I'm happy. Happy to talk about it in the Q&A, which we'll try, we'll try to have. So what is it? What is it about finance? What is it about financiers that causes us to hate them and despise them so much? Be because we do. We do. I mean, constantly, constantly there's talk. I mean, look at, you know, Elizabeth Warren. You know Elizabeth Warren? Unfortunately, Unfortunately you know who she is? She's uh, right now leading, or maybe second place, in the Democratic primaries in the U.S. And her whole agenda, I mean, not the whole agenda, but a big chunk of her agenda, is to bring down Wall Street. And people love it. People get excited by it, right? But it's not like Donald Trump is a huge Wall Street fan either. He 
constantly goes after. I mean, they're part of the elites. They're part of the people that need to be brought down. So it's left and right, historically, of all resented Wall Street, regulated Wall Street. And not just Wall Street, but banks. There's no industry in the United States more regulated than banks. And of course, what's the number one way in which we regulate all banks in Poland, in Europe, in, 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 in the United States, everywhere? What's the number one way in which we, we basically control the banking system, the finance system? What's that? Yeah, central banks. We take the product that banks are supposed to be responsible for, money, and we monopolize it, and we hand it over to government, and they control it. So what's going on? Why is it that we so, so distrust banking, distrust financial markets, that we regulate them almost to death? We keep them alive just enough so they can somewhat do their function so that the economy doesn't collapse completely. We distrust them in popular culture. We blame every crisis on them. And they're always, always the villains of our stories. What is it about them? Well, I mean, there are two, three possibilities. One is that the critics are right. That finance is just paper shuffling. That they don't do anything productive. That there's no real reason why bankers financiers get wealthy. That they really are bad guys. That they just redistribute wealth. And a lot of times when you read a, a textbook on financial markets, they talk about redistribution. And that's what financial markets are responsible for. They take capital in and they figure out somehow who should be the winners and who should be the losers. There's a truth to that. But it's no effort involved. It's just some kind of random allocation or not random, corrupt allocation. So one possibility is they really are just paper shufflers. And the second is that there's something that the culture views as inherently evil in what they do, inherently immoral in what they do. So it could be an economic reason, or it could be an ethical reason, or it could be both. So let's take the economic question first. And look, I've got very limited time to give you an explanation for the economic function of financial markets. So this is going to be very quick and abstract and, you know, and we, we're not going to be able to do all the markets. If you want more of an explanation, it's in the book, right? And the book is somewhere here. I don't know where Tomic put it, but it's somewhere here. Um, and I've got a course on financial markets online on YouTube that lasts, I think, eight hours where I describe in much more great detail. But what do banks do? What do banks, what do financial markets generally, stock markets, banks, what do they actually do? What is their function? Provide they provide liquidity. To whom? I mean, what does liquidity even mean? Right? To whom do they provide liquidity? What do they do? What is the fundamental function of all financial markets and institutions? Connect investors with companies. So on the one side, what financial markets and institutions do is they provide capital to companies. But how do they get the capital? How do they get the money? Savings, right? So financial institutions basically do two things. They aggregate savings and they turn them into investments. What financial markets do is they allow us, and this is really important, they allow us as producers, as individuals, as businesses to save for the future. And they actually provide us a return on that saving, whether it's through a savings account in a bank, whether it's through an investment in a mutual fund or, or, or into the stock market or into a private equity fund or into a hedge fund or whatever the vehicle happens to be, we get to invest in the future and get a return on that investment. And the more risk we're willing to take, the higher the expected return that we will gain. So you go from anywhere from a bank account to a hedge fund 
the risk and return profile is going to be very different. But they allow us to make that kind of investment. What would happen if we didn't have financial institutions? You had some excess money. How would you, what would you do in order to gain a return on that money? You could put it in the mattress. You could dig a hole in the backyard and stuff it down there. Even if you had gold, gold only preserves its value. It doesn't, it's not an investment, right? Gold is just money. It's not an investable vehicle. So what would you do with whatever money you had? You would have to find a business to invest in. You'd have to develop the expertise to be able to evaluate the business. You'd have to take on the risk that you would never get, get a return on that money. You would have to do all that work involved in, and you couldn't diversify. Because you're not gonna find 10 or 100 or 1,000 businesses to invest in. You could do one, two, three, it would be huge amount of work, and how many of us would know what the hell we're looking at? What we even, 99.9% .9 of people have no idea how to invest their money in a particular, specific company. It's difficult, it's complicated. Venture capitalists, venture capitalists when they invest in startups, how many of them, for every 10 investments they make, how many of them go bankrupt? Well, but not 90%, but about five, six. Five, six, they basically get no return on. Then one or two, they get a decent return on. And then one, and if they're really, really, really good or lucky, two are what we call home runs. You know, they get a huge return on. And that return justifies everything else. But that takes unbelievably skill to get one home run out of 10. Most of us don't have that skill. So without financial institutions, we couldn't save. Our ability to save, ability to plan for the future, ability to get the benefits of compounded interest where savings grow over time, is a consequence of the existence of financial markets and institutions. And it's a crucial, crucial function within a society that we have that if we're gonna grow, if we're gonna grow the economy. Now, how does that affect growth? Well, because of what they do with our savings. What do financial markets and institutions do with our savings? They invest them. They make the choices. They use their own expertise to choose who to invest in. And they allocate capital that way. So obviously if you invest in a venture capital firm, they make the decisions about which startups to invest in. If you invest in a bank, they make the choices on who to lend money to. It's not easy. Maybe in the world today where the government guarantees everything, it's easy. But in a proper free market world, it's not easy. It's very difficult. Figure out who's gonna be able to pay back and who's not gonna be able to pay back. And not take a lot of risk because they are not charging you, they're not giving you a lot of money on, the, on your checking accounts because you're not willing to take on a lot of risk. So they can't take on a lot of risk. So they have to make safe investments. And then a stock market, how does a stock market allocate capital? Well, a properly functioning stock market in a free market chooses who to take public and who not to take public, who therefore is good enough to raise capital in the market and who is not. And then once we start trading in the stocks, what does it mean if a stock price is coming down? That we don't think the company's doing well. That we don't think the company has a future. And what do we mean when a stock price comes up? That we do believe in the future. That we believe they are succeeding and will succeed in the future. How does that affect how the company functions? Well, if the stock price is going up, are they going to be able to raise more capital and grow easier or harder? It's going up much easier. If the stock price is coming down, will the company be able to raise capital easier or harder? Much harder. So by buying or selling stocks, we're basically ultimately determining whether a company is going to grow in the future, be able to access capital, be access to grow their functions, or if it's going to die. Because it can grow. You know, take, take the, uh, you know, when automobiles were introduced, right, long, long time ago, in the stock market. At the time, 
there were a lot of companies that made buggies. You know what buggies are? The things behind the horses? Really, really good buggies. All kinds of buggies. From simple, cheap ones to really fancy, expensive ones. And probably the buggy makers were making a lot of money. They were doing really well. And they didn't see the automobile industry because that was like Silicon Valley, way, way far away. It was Detroit. Detroit was the Silicon Valley of America in the, uh, in the late 19th century, early 20th century. But the stock price starts plummeting. Why? Because investors in the stock market, the people who really know what they're doing, are always looking. They're always evaluating industries, entrepreneurs, who's doing what. And they saw Detroit. They saw the auto industry. And what did they do? They bought stocks of autos and sold stocks of buggies. So the buggy industry was declining. The managers didn't even know why. And could the buggies raise money, make, get a bank loan to grow? No, because people said, look, the stock price is going down. We don't know exactly why, but it's a bad sign. So that industry shrunk. And that capital went to the auto industry, which expanded. And you could see that in America in the 1980s. A lot of what today Donald Trump and a lot of people, you know, we lost manufacturing jobs. Yeah, we lost all the crappy jobs, all the terrible jobs that we weren't making any money at. We shut down factories, we closed them down, we took that capital, and we did what with it? Because capital doesn't just disappear. What happened to that capital? It traveled, it was invested where? In Silicon Valley. It's no accident that with the decline of what's called the Rust Belt was also the same time as the rise of Silicon Valley. The 1980s, so decline in old manufacturing jobs where America was inefficient at, was not productive at, where labor costs were too high, and where people were not going to use the stuff anyway anymore. I don't know, like telephone cables. Don't use telephone cables anymore. And all that capital, all that money, all that value that was in that plant and equipment and in the labor shifted to Silicon Valley and created the explosion of growth that happened in the 1980s from Apple to Cisco to Sun Microsystems to Intel to all the other companies that we know that just blew up in the 1980s. Where did that capital come from? It came from more efficient use in manufacturing. That's what finance did. Nobody, no central planner decided that. Imagine a bureaucrat going, oh yeah, Silicon Valley, that's where we should put the money. No bureaucrat has ever done that. Can do it. Central planners, for reasons that Mises discusses extensively in his writings, cannot make those kind of predictions. Are really terrible at it. Even industrial planning at the scale of the Japanese or now China is really, really bad at it. But markets, financial markets, the allocators of capital throughout our economy are brilliant at it. So no, finance is not about paper shuffling. Finance, in a sense, is the most crucial activity in a capitalist economy. There is no more crucial an activity in capitalism, in free markets, than the allocation of capital. There's a reason why bankers make a lot of money. Now put aside the cronyism and put aside all that. But in capitalism, the J.P. Morgans of the world in the days where there was a lot less cronyism, they make a lot of money because what they do is the most value-adding activity in all of capitalism. I know libertarians love to hate financiers like everybody else. But that is a massive error that you guys make. Because without... This is how markets, free markets, allocate capital. This is a free market that allows us to save and then decide who the winners and losers are going to be. But how do they decide who the winners and losers are going to be? Based on greed. This is great motivation. Right? They decide who the winners and losers are going to be based on who is going to provide the highest profit long term. Based on money, making money. And this is fantastic. Because this is the only incentive that really matters in a market. And where, who is going to produce the most profits long term? The people who are going to be most productive long term. The people who are going to enhance our standard of living, our quality of life most long term. The people, the entrepreneurs, who are going to contribute most 
to the economy long term. They're, they're the ones who are going to get the capital because they're the ones who are going to maximize the profits over the long run. So from an economic perspective, bankers, stock markets, hedge funds, private equity funds, and all the rest of the financial institutions and markets, bond markets, are crucial, crucial to a functioning economy. And it's why they get compensated as much as they do. And even in our mixed economy today, even in the mixed economy today, with all the cronyism and with the central bank and the massive regulations and controls and limitations that exist out there on these institutions and markets, they still do a pretty damn good job in allocating capital to where it's most needed, in allowing the shutting down of some industries to allow for the growth of other industries, to bring capital to where entrepreneurs are. Without these markets, there are no entrepreneurs. And for the Marxists, I know there are no Marxists in this room, without entrepreneurs, there's no labor. Labor is a consequence of capital. Labor comes after the capital. Somebody has to invest the money, buy the equipment, organize the company, figure out who does what, and only then do you hire people. And then the people, the workers, don't, you know, they get paid. The capital doesn't get paid until the company's profitable, which in the case, for example, the biotech can be never or 10, 15 years later. And then people complain, drug prices are high. You know, these people are making a lot of money. Yeah, they put their money at risk for 15 years. Now finally, they're getting a little bit of return. So no, there is no reason to despise financial markets and institutions for economic reasons. Because they're unbelievably productive. They are crucial to everything that we do. So what is it that drives this hatred? Now partially it's ignorance. People don't understand economics. People don't understand where, what it is the finance does that makes it possible. Think about, think about the fact that somebody like Bill Gates or Steve Jobs, I mean Steve Jobs can say, look, I gave you this. So I made a few billions of dollars, but you got this, the trade, the win-win trade relationship is more obvious. It's more perceptual. The financier says what? You can't see what I gave you. I made this possible, but yeah, right. I wrote the first check to Steve Jobs when he was a little hippie with long hair and never took a shower. I don't know if you've seen the stories about Steve Jobs. He stunk. And he took a meeting with venture capitalists and he still wrote him a check. Wow, that takes a lot of guts to invest in a hippie, right? But without those finances, this wouldn't exist. But that's an abstraction. That's hard to see. You don't have a product in front of you. Finance doesn't provide you with a thing right in front of your eyes that the entrepreneur can hide behind and say, see, I, I, I made it good for you. So part of the reason we hate financiers is that we can't see what they do and we have to have a certain understanding of what they do. And here I blame economists and, and, and intellectuals who should know what finance do, who should understand finance and still condemn them in spite of that. So that most of the people are ignorant, not for their own fault, but because our intellectuals who are not ignorant, who are just, just bad people, uh, teach them this stuff. But there's a deeper issue, and it's the same issue that I've often talked about in terms of capitalism more broadly. There's something about finance that morally offends, and something about capitalism that morally offends, but in finance, I think it's even more there. What are financiers, what is their goal? What are they trying to do? Because no financier walks up in the morning, no stockbroker, no CEO of a bank or CEO of a Wall Street firm walk, wakes up in the morning and says, I want to make sure our capital is allocated efficiently throughout the US economy. 
What do people who go to Wall Street want to do on a day-to-day -day basis? What is it? What is motivates them? What are they about? Profit, Profit making money. They're about making money. You know, when the financial crisis happened, a lot of people said it's greed on Wall Street that caused the financial crisis. And a friend of mine, uh, John Allison, who is a CEO of a bank, said, that's right. In 2007, there was greed on Wall Street. No greed on 2006 or 2005 or, or 1992 or whatever. Right? It was a new phenomenon. There's always greed on Wall Street. That's a job. To make money. Greed here meaning a single-minded pursuit of making money. On Wall Street, there's no, it's not about a product. It's not about a particular service. What you're trying to do is make money and it's naked. You can't hide behind the product. You can't hide behind anything else. Now, by making money, what are you doing? You're efficiently allocating capital throughout the economy. By making money, what are you doing? You're providing saving, a return on investment to the middle, anybody who saves. Anybody who puts some money aside, anybody who invests in a mutual fund, anybody who buys an index fund, anybody who puts money in a bank. So by trying to make money, you're making the entire economy better off. But you, as an individual, as an institution, you are single-mindedly focused on making money. And we don't like people who make money. Not who are obsessed about it, who that's what they want to do. Because what is making money? Making money is self-interested, it's greedy, it's selfish, it's bad. And we condemn people like that morally. Through all history, we've condemned people who believe that it's okay to pursue money as an end. Finance isn't just one species of all these people. One type of a self-interested human being. But they're the most because it's most naked. You can see it on them. You can see it in the activity, and they make a lot of money. So you justify our distrust, right? It's getting hot up here. Too passionate. You need to calm down. <laughs> and of course, we live in a society that distrusts self-interest. We don't like people who benefit the world by making themselves better. We like people who, I mean, in terms of morality, in terms of ethics, in terms of nobility, virtue, we like people who what? Who help the world by making themselves worse, by sacrifice. We love sacrifice. Now, again, maybe nobody in this room loves sacrifice, and maybe nobody actually wants the sacrifice even out there. But it's not what we actually want for ourselves. It's what we believe is good and noble. Most people don't live the life that they think is good and noble. They live a compromise. Most of the time, they, most of the time, they are out for themselves. Most of the time, they're trying to make money and doing business and trading and win-win relationships and all of that. And then once in a while, they think about it and say, oh, I feel a little guilty because I should have been Mother Teresa. That's what real nobility is. That's what real goodness is. And that's, that's a split within the soul of most people that is very hard. And that's what leads them to often say, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm bad. Raise my taxes. It's okay. Raise my taxes because I didn't help the poor enough. Okay, go after those financiers. Yes, they're behaving just like me. But yeah, but they, with them it's obvious, so go after them. And I know lots of businessmen who say, yeah, regulate me. Not just because they're trying to capture the rents, but also because they feel guilty. And they think they want to cut corners and self-interest, it's not, not good. So, yeah, give me, some, give me, you know, give me a, a certain benchmark to start off with. I, I'm, I'm convinced that Zuckerberg wants regulations not because, right now, not because he wants a competitive advantage, even though it would give him a huge one. Regulations would entrench him. But partially because he doesn't want to worry about all this stuff. It's complicated. Privacy is complicated on the Internet. All this stuff is complicated. Somebody can come and just give him a standard, makes it much easier for him, and he feels a little bit better, doesn't have to take the responsibility, and people will view him better, he thinks. Won't help him, he's too rich. <laughs> too successful. Nobody's gonna like him. Nobody likes rich and successful people too much. Right? Even, even when they start giving their money away, we don't like them too much. Right? 
unless you're Warren Buffett. You know, I don't know if you know Warren Buffett. Like he's he's kind of a he he, he you know he talks simple and he's uh, he's kind of a common man and he plays it down. He plays to the people. So we have this attitude towards self-interest. Bankers are clearly and financiers are clearly self-interested. They make money. So we despise them. You know, take central banks. Why is it that we trust Bernanke? We trust, who's the guy now? Well, we don't trust Powell that much because, because uh, Donald Trump doesn't like him. But we trust central bankers as a culture. Yeah, I mean, Bernanke is the hero of the financial crisis. He saved us. I mean, I don't think history is going to be that kind to him. But people think he was great. And look how much power we've given central bankers. I mean, no financier in all of history has had as much power as the chairman of the Federal Reserve has today. I mean, he can basically dictate the entire economy. He has control over the most important price in the entire economy. What's that price? Price of money. Price of time. Interest rates. The quantity of money, which is hugely crucial to every business decision in the entire economy, every saving decision, everything. Everything is dependent on this quantity and the price of money, which is controlled centrally by a central government, and we trust them completely. Why? We trust them much more than we trusted J.P. Morgan, the banker, the American banker who saved the U.S. economy in 1907. And we hated him. Why? Because Alan Greenspan and Bernanke and Powell and all these and, you know, whoever your new, you know, what's her name, Lagrange, the new uh, European uh, Central Bank? Yep. They're all, what is their motivation? What is the motivation of a central banker? What's the motivation of a central banker? I mean, not the real motivation. What is the motivation presented to the world of a central banker? They're there for what? Fairness, the common good, the public interest. They don't get a bonus. They don't make money. They don't get a percentage of the profits of the Federal Reserve, which makes a lot of money, by the way. All goes to the Treasury. They don't make money. What motivates them? Oh, we just want to make the economy good. We want to make sure capital is allocated. We want to, we're good central planners. We just want to make everybody happy. We're there for the public interest, the common good. And as soon as they say that, we go, okay, they might make mistakes, they might do things wrong, but their motivation is good. Their motivation is positive. They're not in it for themselves. And that makes us feel nice, warm, and fuzzy. Makes us feel good about them. Those bankers, though, they were all about making money. They were all about greed. They're all about themselves. We don't trust them. We don't trust them. When J.P. Morgan saved the U.S. economy in 1907, five years later, he's brought in front of Congress. And the Congress basically says, how dare you make money while saving the U.S. economy? You should have just done it from the goodness of your heart. Who gave you so much power as to be in a position to save the U.S. economy? I mean, he gave himself the power by being a really good banker. No, we're going to take this away from you. We don't want private bankers to make these kind of decisions. We don't want private bankers to be in a position where they have that much power. We want to create a bureaucracy that has a hundred times more power, but is there for the common good and the public interest, and therefore it's okay. It's not about power. It's about motivation. Self-interested motivation, bad. Public interest, good. The general principle should be this. Anytime you hear people talking about the public interest and the common good, run. <laughs> get as far away as you can. I get greed. I get self-interest. I get people who want to make money. I understand how you do that. I know how to deal with them. Trade. Offer them something. They'll offer you something. The only way they can make money is by offering me a value. They don't offer me a value, I don't give them their money. My money. I don't give them my money. 
Public interest? I don't know what that is. I don't even know what the interest of this group in this room is. Do we aggregate it? How do we measure these things? Each one of us has a different interest. Do we have some common utility function up here? I mean, we don't even have an individual utility function that you can measure. How do we measure the common good, the public interest? There is no such thing. All it means is they're going to sacrifice me. That's all I know. When I hear public interest or common good, they're after me. They're going to sacrifice me or anybody successful. They're going to sacrifice the successful to the unsuccessful. That's what the common good and the public interest is. Or they're going to manipulate things to help the group that helps them politically. That's what it means. So, to summarize, finance is the most productive, the most important function within a free market. It's despised and hated because it's nakedly self-interested. Unless we change our attitude towards self-interest, and this is one of the many great contributions Ayn Rand, Ayn Rand makes to this whole debate about capitalism, about freedom, about individualism. Unless we change our attitude towards self-interest, unless we develop a positive moral attitude, a positive moral view of self-interest, Financiers will always be hated, financial markets will always be regulated, and we will never, ever, ever have capitalism, free market, laissez-faire free market, that I think most of us in this room believe in. At the end of the day, the battle that we all face is a moral battle. It's a battle for a new morality, a morality that it respects, a morality that's focused on self, on the individual, on the individual's moral right to pursue his own happiness, which in many cases means to pursue his own wealth. Thank you all. Do you have some time for questions? Do you like to answer some questions? I love questions. You know me. Particularly from polls, they always challenge me. Thank you. Um, my name is Pavel Thank you so much for your talk. Uh, my name is Pavel Benedikczynski. I'm actually a, a banker on Wall Street. So thank you so much for defending us. I think it's uh, incredible. And my question is, where do you see the regulation going for Wall Street and overall financial markets after MIFID and after all the regulation has been growing, like I can see it at my own bank, the compliance team has been const constantly growing. And uh, yeah, where, where do you see that regulation going? You think there's going to be a cap where people realize that it's counterproductive? So where, where is regulation on Wall Street and banking and finance globally going? Uh, I think it's going to get worse before it gets better. Um, it might get better at some point, but for that you would need kind of a a Reagan Thatcher kind of moment where some people who have some respect for free markets and understand the, the, the incredible damage that regulations do to markets, uh, you'd have to have them become popular and, and, and become, get into positions of power. And I don't see that happening anytime soon. In America, uh, Reagan wouldn't even, you know, wouldn't be elected president today, wouldn't win the Republican nomination. He would, I don't think he would even run because it was so hopeless. Right now, in, in uh, I mean, Reagan's attitude towards America, towards immigration, towards the regulation, towards generally the economy, is so foreign to Republicans today. It's a completely different political party that I, I you know, I just don't see that coming. On the other hand, if you look at, uh, if you look at even Trump, he has Mnuchin as uh, as Treasury Secretary. Mnuchin is, you know, a, a uh, heavy, heavy hand at the Treasury. So if of all the regulations that everybody says Trump has reduced regulations, the one area where they really haven't, or they've done very little, is in finance. Because, they, they, you know, they came in and Republicans said, we're going we're gonna to undo Dodd-Frank, which was this big regulatory bill after financial crisis. They barely touched it, a little bit for small banks, nothing for Wall Street. Mnuchin's a, 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 you know, a, a central planner. He's a, Former chairman of Goldman Sachs, regulations help Goldman Sachs. There's no incentive.
for them to actually reduce regulations. And they're not, this administration is not going to do it in the financial markets. Plus, they fear the risks. So the funny thing is that when the financial crisis happened, everybody said, oh, it's deregulation. And I, I often debated this. I would say to people, name what was deregulated. I want a list of the things that were deregulated. And they, they can't come up with anything because uh, nothing under Bush. One thing they can come up with. There was this deregulation of Glass-Steagall in under Bill Clinton, not even under Bush. And then I say, show me one bank that was affected by Glass-Steagall that, that got into trouble during the financial crisis. It turns out there's only one called Citibank, but Citibank always gets into trouble. So it's, it, you know, it's, it's, a, it's the most terrible bank in all of U.S. history. Uh, they can't make the connection, but in people's minds, deregulation of banks caused the financial crisis. And therefore, everybody's afraid to deregulate because they'll be blamed for the next crisis. So I don't know when the day will come when they deregulate. All over the world, they're increasing regulation. In England, uh, the regulations were fairly good. I mean, relatively good relative to America before the financial crisis, are much worse today. Uh, in Europe, in Europe, your banks, I mean, Western Europe banks are basically bankrupt. I mean, Deutsche Bank is a disaster. The French banks are a disaster. Uh, they, you know, you bailed, out, you bailed out Greece in order to bail out Deutsche Bank because Deutsche Bank owned all the Greek bonds. But partially, Deutsche Bank owned all the Greek bonds because the governments wanted, I mean, one of the things that governments do with banks is they have this deal where you better buy our bonds. And we'll count them as zero risk, by the way, so you don't have to hold any capital against them. And so that whole convoluted system, I just don't see it getting cleaned up anytime soon. I don't see a political movement. I don't see a political leader. I generally don't see real movement towards free markets, certainly not in, financial, in the financial industry. Hello, uh, my name is Łukasz Kempa. I'm a tax advisor, so one of very few trades hated almost uh, as much as financial as people working on financial well, no, markets? Not really, not if you help me reduce my taxes. <laughs> okay, so the we only, can... The only thing I would tell you is, under laissez-faire capitalism, you wouldn't have a job. Okay, so we can talk later. Uh, but I, th I find your speech well, quite pessimistic, actually, because, uh, because uh, from, I understand that the tendency of hating uh, people working in financial markets, basically people who want to make money, uh, dates back very, very, very long time. Yes, like for Shakespeare's times. And yeah. you say that uh, we, should, we should counteract it. But, but how? I cannot see any, any, uh, any, any way of uh, changing people's attitude towards, uh, towards such people and such activity. I, yeah, it's, it, my talk is very pessimistic. Uh, and my talks generally are quite pessimistic in that sense, that to change the world is going to require much more than we are doing right now. And to change the world means, to change the world philosophy of capitalism, means to change our ethical code, to change the way we view morality. And I know, because I've been here in Poland before, that you guys resist this, um, and people do all over the world, right? I think we have to turn away from 2,000 years of a particular moral code, which is anti, inherently anti-finance, and inherently anti-markets, and inherently anti-capitalist, which is a moral code of sacrifice, a moral code that views the good as that which causes us pain and suffering versus the good as brings us wealth and prosperity and happiness. So as long as we hold an altruistic morality, a morality of sacrifice, we will not have freedom. Any ideas where to start? Yes, yeah, start with Ayn Rand. Start with Ayn Rand because she is the only thinker, the only author that has presented us since Aristotle that has presented us with a moral code that replaces the conventional moral code. And unless we're willing to do that, then forget it. And in my view, the biggest tragedy of the liberty movement for the last hundred years has been that they have not taken Ayn Rand seriously enough, particularly in her morality, not in energized around capitalism and so on, yeah, you've, got, you've got great economists to deal with capitalism, right? Mises and so on. But philosophically, and without taking her moral view seriously in terms of self-interest, 
We will not change the world out there. It will always, it will, it will go like this, but it will always rebound against us because people will always feel the guilt. They will always resent success. They will always resent the self-interest of capitalists and financiers and, and business people. So we, you need, you know, I've got a book, somebody has it here uh, called uh, uh, Free Market Revolution. In my view, the revolution is not an economics revolution. We've had great economists. They, we, you know, we, we, nobody's done a better job explaining free market economics than the people who have, you know, that, that we have already. I mean, it's done. We've explained it. We need to do more, granted. We need to get to more people. But we've got it. That's not the challenge. What we need is a moral revolution. And that's only Ayn Rand can get us. And that's why you should all, there's Atlas Shrugged in the back there by Ayn Rand. But read Virtue of Selfishness. There's a book. I don't know if it's in Polish. Is it in Polish? Yes. yes. Read Virtue of Selfishness. That's, that's the moral revolution right there. And unless we're willing to embrace that, we lose. Uh, Artem Rushin. So, uh, as I understand, uh, regulations will collapse actually in somehow the market, I mean financial market. So, uh, less and less money will uh, stay there. And money usually want to be invested in uh, places where they feel good and can multiply. Yeah. So, is, in this moment, as we're uh, collapsing, for example, Lo uh, Wall Street, where those money will go? How do you think? Well, I mean, that's the, that's the big question. Where does the money go? And, and right now, if you look at what the, the politics of it is, where the, where the money wants to go, where, where the politicians want the money to go, is to Washington. It's to, you know, government. It's to the growth of the U.S. government. I mean, Elizabeth Warren, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, the Democratic Party generally has plans to spend, to consume, right? Government, government spending is consumption. It's not investment, it's consumption. They want to consume trillions and trillions of dollars, whether on healthcare, on a Green New Deal, on all kinds of stuff. They have great plans to take all their money through a wealth tax. And by the way, what does a wealth tax do? It reduces the amount of money that goes into financial markets. Because who puts money in financial markets? The rich. Because the rich don't consume, they save. So it's, they want to reduce saving and increase government consumption. So the money is likely to flow to government. The other thing you're seeing, I think, globally, one of the reasons interest rates are so low in the world today, I mean, put aside central banker manipulation, because that's part of it, a big part of it. But there's also another aspect for why interest rates are so low. And that is, in my view, because the investment opportunities, there's a shortage in good investment opportunities. There's a shortage in entrepreneurs. If you're in Silicon Valley today, it's relatively easy if you have a good idea to raise capital. The challenge is there are not enough people with good ideas. There's more capital than there are good ideas. So, now that I think is a consequence of statism, of, of uh, you know, people being trained not to be entrepreneurs, not to innovate, not to think for themselves. It's a consequence of bad education. Um, you know, it's, it's, and it's a consequence of the fact that there's still parts of the world that are very, very, very authoritarian. But, Right now, we have a shortage of, I think we still have a shortage of good investments. And that is only going to get worse because as government grows, they're going to suck, you know, they, people are going to have less ideas. The other thing the regulation does, one of the things the regulation does, I'll give you an example. I, I'm a strong believer that if we didn't have regulation on biotech, for example, we would have today technologies that would extend life significantly, that we would be living well into our hundreds today, if not for the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration in the United States. So the FDA has basically said they will not approve drugs that extend life. So if you're a venture capitalist and I have a great idea for a drug to extend life, are you going to give me money? No, because it's never going to be approved. I, oh, I'll, 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 I'll make it in Mexico. Well, it, well, but the risk has gone up dramatically and I'm going to give you less money. Because in America, you won't be able to sell it. So. What regulations does is it limits the amount of investments we can do, right? Like uh, Elon Musk has this drilling machine. Have you seen this drilling machine that builds these tunnels? It's really amazing, right? And it builds tunnels really, really cheaply. But who are the only people who build tunnels? Who are allowed to build tunnels? Who think of building tunnels? Governments, right? But imagine if that was all private and suddenly you had an investment boom into building tunnels, but you know, you're not gonna get that. So, 
regulation limits the possibilities of investment. And therefore, I think today there's a shortage of investable opportunities. That's why not only are the government controlled interest rates low, but generally the yield curve is flat. There's very little competition for the dollars that are available to invest. Yeah, and in this curve, I understand that we're going down, but uh, in, some, in some other, because uh, it's still... Uh, whole so what will happen when it all collapses? Uh, uh, no, the, what's all savings, which will not... Uh, because as a smart people, pe smart people will not invest in uh, economies will, which will collapse. So they have to invest somewhere else, or just... Uh, or not, or buy gold and bury it in the backyard, oh, which a lot of people are doing. And I think when the collapse happens, that's the first instinct, is to hoard because you don't know what's coming. And gold is a nice way to hoard because it has some inflation protection. But that's the real danger is, is people stop savings, people start, but that's, that's doom and gloom. That's, uh, but I, I think you're seeing more of that. You're seeing more people looking for safety. Or you will see that when the collapse happens, which means bad for investment and entrepreneurs. Questions? Uh, I've got a question. Yeah. Uh, why do you think uh, so many Austrian economists, uh, past and present, who should be advocates for freedom and capitalism, are so adverse to fractional reserve lending by banks? Because they don't understand finance? <laughs> I mean, I, I, I think it's a mistake to be averse to fractional reserve banking. I, I mean, again, as long as it's not fraud, as long as you're told when you deposit the money that there's a possibility that under some circumstances you won't be able to get the money back, it's a contract. There's no fraud involved. So it's not an issue of fraud. Yes, there's some economic argument that fractional reserve banking gets, you know, the, the, the growth and the contraction of the money supply is out of our control. I mean, it, it, it multiplies. Okay, but that's what markets are. They're not in your control. Um, uh, you know, and, and, and Selgin and White have done some good analysis and good studies that show that that is not a threat, that it's fairly, that it's stable over time, that it doesn't create kind of the business cycle as described. Um, you know, I, 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 I think, I mean, I, I, I would say personally, I think that some of them, I think that generally in Austrian economics, in the modern Austrian economics, I don't think that this is certainly not true of, 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 the, of the original Austrians, Manger and, and all the way to Mises. But I think in a more modern Austrian economics, there is a certain disdain, a certain mistrust of finance, and a certain lack of understanding of finance. I mean, one of the things I find frustrating is that Austrians don't talk about finance, but finance is crucial to economics and to understanding economics. I mean, we talk about interest rates in, in economics, an interest rate. The interest rate's gonna be this or an interest rate's gonna be that. But in finance, I'm a finance guy, right? There is no interest rate. There are many interest rates. And it makes a big difference whether you're talking about the short-term rate or the long-term rate, the risk-free rate or the risky rate, and what, you know, all of that needs to be adjusted. You can't just use one interest rate. Now, in economics, we have to abstract a little bit because we're dealing with big concepts. But I think, I think there's a certain mistrust of finance. I think there's an ignorance of finance. And I think there's even, at the moral level, there's a certain, uh, about finance among some Austrians. Now, I'm a huge admirer of many Austrian economists, not all of them. Um, so I, I think they make other mistakes as well, some of them, right? This is just one of them. But no, a fraction of reserve banking is fine. It's morally fine because it's voluntary, it's a transaction, you know exactly what you're doing. Even today, when you go to the bank and open a bank account in America, it says there's certain circumstances where you do not get your money back. Okay, I'm taking a risk. So what? I know, if I know it, it's not fraud. And, it's, and if it's not fraud, who, is, who are you as an economist to tell the government to ban a certain activity. I thought that's what we were against, right? I thought we were for freedom. So if I want to give a bank money and take the risk of not getting it back, if there's a run on the bank, then it's my business. It's not your business. It's not the central, it's not the government's business. So there's no issue of fraud. There. Yes. Oh, that way. Okay, okay another one. Uh, hi, uh, Darius Tishega. I wanted to ask you about what do you think uh, the causal re relationship between bad business practices and regulation is? Is our bad business practices a result of regulation or is it vice versa? Um, I think it's both. So there's no question that sometimes businesses behave badly. I mean, sometimes we behave badly. 
right, as individuals. Sometimes businesses behave badly. Politicians then use the bad behavior of businessmen to regulate them. The regulations now create all kind of weird incentives that often lead to bad behavior that then is not blamed on the regulation, but behaved on the behavior which leads to more regulation, which then continues the circle. So um, I'll, give you, I'll give you an example. Most, when you look at, um, in, in the late 1990s, the early 2000s, there was a, a, a lot of fraud in, um, in, uh, in, uh, in, business, in certain businesses in the United States. I, I don't know if you guys are young, but there was Enron and WorldCom, and Enron was very, very famous. But there was like five or six big businesses that had committed accounting fraud, all pretty much at the same time. It was like, see, this is what happens. And they were all in industries that were so-called deregulated. They all happened to be in the same basic set of industries. They all dealt with telecommunications or energy. But they were all very heavily regulated, but they, the perception was they'd be deregulated. And one of the things that if you really study these companies, you discover is that the skill set, because they're so heavily regulated, the skill set of a CEO changes in a regulated industry versus a non-regulated industry. So what, what is the primary skill of a CEO, let's say in Silicon Valley, which is a relatively low regulation place, right? What is the skill set of a, of, a, of a technology CEO? What is the most important thing that, he, that he'd be able to do? Innovate. Well, innovate, run a company, run a technology company, figure out ways to make money, manage people well, right? So his whole orientation of a CEO in a company in a free market is towards business, profits, managing a company long-term well. What is the orientation of a CEO in a regulated industry? Meet the legal requirements. Meet the legal requirements or change the legal requirements. That is, capture the legal requirements, manipulate the politicians in your favor. What happens is the kind of CEO is a different kind of person. The kind of person who runs a company well in a free market is not the same person who runs a company well in a regulated market. In a regulated market, you need to be a politician. You need to be able to schmooze with politicians. You need to be able to manipulate politicians. You need to be able to be nice to politicians. You need to be a schmoozer, a social animal that villains in Iron Man's Atlas Shrugged. They're the kind of CEOs who run regulated businesses. And they run them, quote, well, in the sense that they capture rents, in the sense that they make the politicians leave them alone. So if you look at Enron, for example, Enron was fascinating because Enron, during the 90s, if you, if you just followed the stories of the Enron CEO and chairman of the board, they were huge friends of the Bushes. They were at all the best parties. They were in Washington, D.C. often, or in, or in uh, the State House in Texas often. They spent more time schmoozing politicians than they did running the business. And they got, they developed a certain arrogance around that. So, you know, we fudged their counting numbers a little bit, but we know important people. So everything will be fine. And so many of these companies, that was the tendency. Even some entrepreneurs who in the beginning of their career were real entrepreneurs got to a point where they had to deal with Washington every single day because that was their business, got corrupted by that fact. And, and whereas during this period, no companies in Silicon Valley committed fraud, except for one, I think. But there was almost nothing going on there. It was all in these heavily regulated industries because that supports it. So it goes both ways. It's usually an excuse. Oh, they, the food was not healthy or whatever, right? You know, the, the, the meat had bacteria in it, so we regulate the meat. But now that you're regulated, first of all, you're looking for loopholes. Secondly, you become the kind of company that I just described. So it's a self-fulfilling kind of circular process. Somebody have a microphone? Yeah. Okay. Hi, uh, Roman Wazarski. Um, thank you for your lecture. Very interesting things uh, you said there, uh, especially about the uh, 
the, the worship of the sacrifice. Yeah, and then we sacrifice ourselves for somebody else, uh, gain nothing, and, and we worship that. Yes. Yeah, that's, uh, that's definitely wrong, but I don't consider uh, sacrifice itself as uh, to be something wrong, you know? Uh, because uh, definitely to, to make money, to become a capitalist, to, to succeed in anything, you have to, you have to sacrifice. Only you sacrifice in, the, in an yeah. individual dimension, right? Yeah, obey, so... Obey certain order, right? And et cetera, et cetera. And um, my question is basically um, on something else, but... Um, Can I answer that question before you get yeah, to that or something yeah, yeah. else? Because I disagree with you. Um, so one of the ways in which they get us to uh, embrace this morality of sacrifice is by diluting the word is by changing its meaning. What you do in a business is not a sacrifice. You do not sacrifice in a startup. You do not sacrifice your money when you invest it or save it. That is not a sacrifice. Because what are you pursuing when you're pursuing, when you work really, really hard in a startup and you stay up really, really late and you never see your family and you're really working hard? What, why are you doing that? Because it's the most important thing to you. It is, otherwise you wouldn't do it. It's the most important thing to you. So you're not giving up. Sacrifice, the meaning of a sacrifice, the, the real meaning of a sacrifice, is giving up something really, really important for something less or nothing. If I, uh, you know, if, 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 I, if, I, if I buy an iPhone for $1,000, I'm not sacrificing $1,000 to get an iPhone. That's a distortion of the word. Because I'm getting something in return of higher value than what I gave up. You're giving up, by, by working in your startup, you're giving up something really important, your family, let's say. But you know what? The reason you're doing it is because at that point in time, your work is more important to you than your family. And if it's not, stop doing it. Go back to your family. But you recognize that long term, you will be able to take care of your family, you will be able to take care of yourself, and your joy and your happiness are dependent on you working hard really right now. And that is not a sacrifice. When a basketball player doesn't take the shot and passes the ball because another player has a better shot than he, he's not sacrificing. He's winning. He's engaging in activity that leads to him winning. Because he values the team win over his personal statistics. Because at the end of the day, he's going to be judged about whether he's a winner or a loser. And passing the ball. So it's not being selfish to take a, a stupid shot when you, you're not going to make it, I know you guys watch basketball, when, you, when, you, you know, when, you, when you're not going to make, when you're going to make the shot, that's not selfish, that's stupid. The selfish thing is to pass the ball so you can win. And that's not a sacrifice. So we use the term wrongly. Sacrifice is giving up something really important to you for nothing or for something less important. That's a self-sacrifice. What you do at work, that's not a sacrifice. Not really. It's the dilution of the term in order to make the real sacrifice palatable to you. All right, thank you. So uh, the other part of the question is about uh, money, uh, the value of the money, because I'm looking for these factors that stand nowadays behind uh, the value of money. What, in your opinion, is, uh, is the, main, the main factor uh, deciding on money value? Or is it pure power now? Or what is it? Well, once you have fiat money and once you have government, what stands behind the value of money is the government, the, the, the fact that the government is, takes it in as taxes, is willing to accept it as taxes, and the, one, and the fact that legal tender laws uh, make it the way in which you pay your debts. You pay your debts in dollars, so, you know, your local currency, because the government says so, right? Um, and at the end of the day, the value of the money, you know, what, which means what you can buy for it, that's the value of money is what you can buy for it, is determined by supply and demand for that money, by, by what you know, we want to do with money, right? and by what the Federal Reserve, the central bank, is doing. Right? The more it prints, the less valuable it becomes. Right? And the more it constrains the amount of money, the more valuable it becomes, because the more stuff it can buy, the more demand there is for it. So it's basically a very complex story about supply and demand. Right? Both our demand to consume, our demand to, 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 to invest, our demand to save, but also the supply that the Federal Reserve provides and the price at which it is willing to provide. So 
But in terms of what, it, what gives value to, to this five euro piece of paper, I mean, the governments that stand behind it. And because it's governments, to some extent, what this is worth is, is random. It's, it's, it's dependent on the whim of central bankers. And that's the sad state in which we live. You know, in a laissez-faire capitalist world, money would have to be backed by something real and it would be issued by banks or by anybody. I don't know, it doesn't matter. But it would have to be backed by something. And this would be, you could take this and exchange it for the thing that represents money, traditionally, usually gold. But that's real money. This is, we call this fiat money because it's kind of not really real. It's pretend money. But it, it functions as money because it's all we have. Because the governments have given us no choice. I can't see if anybody has a microphone or not. Oh. Uh, Tomasz Waszczyk, thank you for a great talk. And uh, I would like to ask from the CFA point of view. And they ask what? I'm sorry. CFA. CFA Founded Financial Foundation. Yeah. Yeah. They send the information that the, uh, the area of low interest rates will continue in long term. And what do you think about the interest rate within 10 years, whether they are going to rise or not? <laughs> Then if I knew, maybe, I'd be maybe 20 years, maybe 20 years. What's that? Maybe 20 years, within 20 Over years. Over the next so 20 years. Wow. I mean, I don't know what interest rates are going to be tomorrow, never mind in 20 years. But look, negative interest rates is the dumbest policy in human history. No marketplace would ever create negative interest rates, right? Yeah, yeah but um, I agree. But from the point of view of central banks, it's good when they are low. Well, it's not clear that it's good because it has to lead to disaster. It can't, the, you know, every action has a consequence. And when you do an action that is so perverse and anti-markets and the opposite of what a market demands, then you are creating a crisis down the road. And the negative interest rates are going to result in some massive financial crisis down the road. I don't know when. If I did, I'd make a lot of money. I don't know exactly how it's going to manifest itself. But the fact is, if you're paying people to borrow money, the crisis is going to happen right here when I fall off the stage. If you're paying people to borrow money, what are they going to do? They're going to borrow money like there's no tomorrow. And you're seeing that. You're seeing that. But primarily governments are borrowing huge quantities of money. To some extent, corporations are borrowing large amounts of money, and individuals are borrowing large amounts of money. At some point, they won't be able to pay it off. And then you'll get a ripple effect. So, because at some point, interest rates will come up, because otherwise you'll get inflation. And, and you know, it looks like while central banks love 2% inflation, this magical number of 2% that they worship, You know, they, they will have to raise rates if in inflation gets higher than that. But again, I don't know how it's... I mean, one of the things about the, the financial world right now in terms of interest rates and so on is they created such a distorted, perverted, complicated world that it's very hard to untangle everything that's going to happen. I mean, your, the new central banker of... of uh, uh, European central banker that's coming in, she wants to do helicopter money. You know what helicopter money is? The problem with the way money is distributed today into the system is it goes through the banks, into the financial markets, drives up the value of financial assets, and all the inflation is manifest in assets. And the underlying inflation, which they think should grow at 2%, doesn't budge. So she says the way to get inflation up, the way to, get the, the way to reduce inequality, to get economic activity going, to get consumption going, they worship consumption. That's the other thing. They worship consumption. They think consumption drives the economy. Again, the opposite of the Austrians, right? They, they think consumption drives the economy. Is to get the money into the hands of consumers instead of into the hands of banks. So the way to do that is, you know, to drop money from helicopters. Now, they won't literally drop money from helicopters. But imagine, you know, UBI would do this or something like a universal basic income. Imagine they just send everybody a check for 1,000 euro. Every, everybody in Europe gets a check for 1,000 euro. Okay, so you have mentioned about the UBI, so I need to, uh, to, um, to ask the last question. Yeah. And do you think, what, what do you think about the idea that the low interest rates are just tools to pauperize people massively worldwide? 
And do what to people? Pauperize. To make them poor? Yeah. So, and once more time, thank you for a great talk. So interest rates, you mean negative interest rates? So negative interest rates are means to turn people poor. Now, I don't believe that. I believe that negative interest rates are a tool to facilitate more power in the hands of the people who want power, primarily central bankers and, and central governments. I think negative interest rates are a symptom of the sheer ignorance of most economists in the world today who have no idea what's going on. I think negative interest rates are an act of desperation on the hands of central bankers who fear the thing they fear more, most than anything else is a recession. And a recession would actually be good because recessions clear out the garbage. And one of the big problems of the last few recessions is we've not allowed the garbage, you know, ba all banks were bailed out in America instead of letting them go, some of them go bankrupt. Um, uh, auto companies in America were bailed out. Uh, uh, many industries were bailed out. Greece was bailed out. So the thing they, they resist is the market mechanism, which is a recession, to clear out the malinvestment, to clear out the garbage, to clear out the bad investments. And negative interest rates facilitate more bad investments and the, the continuation of bad investments. So I think it's, it's a sign of how bankrupt and incompetent and stupid and power lusting they are. Because the more power they give to the market, the weaker they are. This is a way to limit the market's power. You know, Japan, in 19, I think it was 1991, Japan had the big um, uh, stock market drop and really has never recovered, has been stagnating since then. They've had stagnation, they've had nothing. And, and I'd say the biggest reason why the Japanese economy never recovers, because it doesn't allow bankruptcies. It doesn't allow people to go out of business. It doesn't allow companies to fire workers. It doesn't allow the markets to adjust. So it's stuck at the 1991 level of employment of companies and it's all locked into that and you don't get what Schumpeter called the creative destruction that comes from some companies going out of business and new companies being born and capital flowing from the bad what I said about the 80s where capital went from the, the Rust Belt to Silicon Valley that can't happen in Japan it's all just static and Europe is is becoming more like that and America America is becoming more like that. So maybe the American wants to be the Japan? Well, uh, yes, America wants to be Japan, and Europe wants to be Japan, and, and, and now it looks like China wants to be Japan. So yes, the Japanese model is dominant, partially because people think, oh, it's stable, and partially because people don't get it. People don't, they don't want uncertainty involved in bankruptcy, in, in capital being reallocated, in, in people laid off, they don't want the social upheaval of people losing their jobs. They, what they want more than anything is stability and safety. And it's not just the politicians, unfortunately. It's us, it's the people. We want stability and safety. And if you want stability and safety, what are you giving up? Wealth, prosperity, progress, you know, and, and happiness. You can't be happy with safety and stability. So you're giving up all the good stuff for this, and that's what I think central banks are, are trying to achieve. So it's not like, you know, the, the rich people get together in some castle somewhere in Europe and say, oh, we want to make the world poor, so let's raise interest rates. No, it's, it's much more incompetent than that. I mean, I don't, I don't think, I don't think, I don't think the conspiracy theories work because I, I, I don't think the people who, A, I don't think people are that, quite that evil, but, or at least those people are not quite that evil, but also because they're not that competent. Central planning doesn't work, including conspiracy theories. Conspiracy theories are massive central plans, which don't work, right? So it's more incompetence, it's more preserving power and doing what short term will preserve power than it is trying to make the world poor on purpose. Okay, last question here. Hello, I'm Maxim Kowarski, and uh, I have a question. I hope, you, I hope you agree it's easier to change a person's mind on economics than on a very subjective fundamental values. Therefore, if we try to change a person's mind on their values and try to make them egoist and then promote capitalism, I think we're scaring them away. 
And I agree that capitalism is inherently egoist, as egoism is a self-preserving uh, behavior. But shouldn't we present capitalism as a means to common good, so as a means to uh, more, more wealth? Uh, wouldn't that be a better way to, of achieving our goal, so free, free market capitalism? Thank you. No. <laughs> and that's how we'd be doing it. That's how everybody does it, except me. Everybody does it that way. Everybody presents capitalism as good for the common good, for the public interest. It's all utilitarianism, from you know the Austrians to the Chicago School to all the great economists have presented this over and over again. And it is in the common good, and it's obvious that it's in the common good in the sense that common means good for individuals that make up the common, right? I mean, and, and all the evidence in the world is out there that it's good economically. It creates wealth, it creates prosperity, it's much better. I mean, everybody can see it, right? North Korea, South Korea, we've all done the examples. Poland. Under communism, Poland today, a little bit of capitalism goes a huge way to create enormous amounts of wealth. We all know that. Everybody on planet Earth knows it deep down in some way. They know. Because if not, they're the biggest liars in the world and they're lying to themselves. They know. Even Elizabeth Warren knows. More than anybody, maybe. Bernie Sanders, all these people know that if you want wealth, if you want, quote, the common good, Capitalism is the best way to do it. They don't care. They don't care. Morality trumps economics every single time. And it's true. You can convince some young people, and I've seen this, the, 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 the liberty movement is dominantly young people, and you can convince young people of the economics, and then they go off and they leave their students for liberty, or they leave their things, and they go off into the real world, and they have a family, and the morality kicks in, and 10 years later, they're all kind of middle of the road centrists or maybe even socialists. Because people are not driven by economics. You're not going to change their mind over, you'll change their mind for a little while, but not over a lifetime. But if you can get them on the morality, the economics is easy. And if you can get them on the morality, they're probably yours for the long run. And the economics is... I mean, again, I, I, don't think, I don't think it's hard. All you have to have is eyes. Go to Hong Kong. I mean, Hong Kong a few months ago. Uh, I mean, it, it, it's tragic. Does anybody... Everybody knows why Hong Kong is rich. Everybody knows why Hong Kong is rich. No natural resources. There are no excuses why a statist would justify the wealth of Hong Kong. Right? Like America, they say, oh, we exploited people in, and, uh, in America. We had natural resources. a rich country. Bullshit, but okay. Hong Kong has nothing except freedom. And it became the richest, I mean, on a per capita basis, richer than America. With nothing except freedom. So all you need is eyes and a bit of a mind and look around the world and see what works and what doesn't, and you should be a capitalist. That hasn't worked, and it won't work, and it can't work. Because as long as you're pulled in another direction, as long as you say, yes, I made money, but it's evil. Inequality is high. Who the hell cares about inequality? But everybody cares now about inequality. So inequality is more important than the common good. Wealth creation, freedom, all of that. Why is inequality more important? Because the needy are needy. And you have to sacrifice for them. That's what the morality demands. And who are you going to sacrifice? Well, the people who have to the people who have not. And that's what every status does. The people who have sacrifice to the people who have not. Or sacrifice the people who are not like us to the people who are like us. The racist version or the class version is the people in the upper class to the people in the working class. It's always sacrificing some to others. And you can't get out of that because it's a moral argument. There is, I mean, let me end with this. There is no economic argument for statism. There is no economic argument for statism. Paul Krugman's not a real economist. Stiglitz. Deep down is not an economist. Thomas Piketty is a lying, deceiving something, but not an economist. There's no economic theory in Das Kapital for the 21st century. There's data. Data that when people looked very careful at it was manipulated, was not clean, was not right, was not good. 
These people are not honest because there is no economic theory for statism. We won that argument. Mises won the argument. It's over. So where is the problem? It's not in economics. Somewhere else. Thank you. Thank you.